Okay, good evening guys. Welcome back to the Malaysian Architecture Education Online Series, proudly presented by MASA. Hope you guys are doing well and thank you for joining us for tonight. So for those who are new, MASA is Malaysia Architecture Student Alliance and is a non-profit student community acting directly under PEM, which is Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, consisting of student representatives from all architecture institutes in Malaysia. During this time, MASA and PAM have decided to launch this online lecture series for students to be more productive and gain more insight. Architect Adrenta is the head of PAM Education and Dr. Zach Zayul is the convener. My name is Iris, a MASA representative from UCSI University and I'll be your MC for today. So tonight's topic will be environmental tropical building design with passive and active strategies. Our speaker for this lecture will be Mr. Mahmoud. He's from Syria, graduated from International Islamic University, IIUM, with Bachelor in Architecture for part one. After that, he worked in the industry for around two years in Malaysia. Later on, he pursued his master's degrees in Cardiff University, UK, with the course of Environmental Design of Building, and worked part-time for six months. Currently, he is doing his part two in UPM and working part time as well. So you all can sit back and relax. We'll, we will have a Q and A session at the end of the talk. But if you have any question during the sharing, feel free to type them down in the chat box so we can attempt to them at the end of the sharing. All right. Without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Mahmud. Hi, Mr. Mahmud. Hello. Hi, Iris. Okay. I will pass the ground to you. All right, thank you so much, Iris, for the nice introduction. And uh, good evening, guys. Uh, thank you all for attending this session. I wouldn't say it's a lecture, I would just say it's a sharing session. I understand it's uh, Saturday evening and uh, it's a weekend and you guys want to have fun. However, I only make this session, uh, I mean, it will take around uh, 45 to 50 minutes only so you guys can have uh, fun later uh, at night. So I will share my screen now. Um, all right. Okay. So um, as it was mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, today's topic is about environmental, sustainable, tropical building design. So the topic itself is quite um, large and very big and uh, we can't really contain all this uh, information in one session or uh, one day or maybe one week. However, uh, for today I try to pick and choose what I believe is suitable uh, for students or even for a professional to uh, do in their designs. Uh, specifically in, in uh, Malaysia and uh, or I call it tropical um, tropical country um, so uh, if you guys have any question later on or if you need any for example uh, short consultation about your environmental sustainable uh, strategies you can always uh, contact me by my email uh, or my social so uh, for, for this session, um, what I want to focus on is, first thing is the climate parameters. Um, there are always factors that are very important to consider whenever we design. And then we will go through the, uh, some passive strategies and also some active strategies as well. And uh, I, I will mention a couple of, of case studies. Um, which actually achieved the net zero energy in uh, it's either in Malaysia or outside. And at the end, I will mention some useful softwares for you. Uh, so you basically can use these tools to test your own buildings and uh, efficiency of the building. So um, at, at the beginning, uh, when we say sustainability, the topic is very large. And uh, when we are talking about holistic sustainability, it's actually have the environment and economic and social. And uh, however, for today, we are focusing on environment uh, in specific. And I would like to mention that there are two uh, modules for uh, 
holistic sustainability. What you see in front of you here um, are two diagrams that are explaining holistic sustainability. However, if I ask, uh, for example, like what's the difference uh, between these two modules? They're both talking about the same thing, but then the difference is uh, in the importance of the uh, sustainability itself. As we can see on the left side diagram, is basically more into some small parts that interconnect with each other that creates the sustainability. However, for the right diagram, it's basically the whole uh, circle of economy or society or environment is actually should be sustainable so we can create a holistic sustainability. So why well, I, I believe this, the, the right diagram is much stronger and deeper in meaning. I just wanted to uh, mention this one um, difference uh, for, for, for this uh, beginning of this topic. And then another thing uh, before we start, also talking about um, thermal comfort. Now, this is basically one of the main reasons that we choose to design in a sustainable way. And um, the thermal comfort is basically it's, it's just a um, state of mind that we feel comfortable in that space. And I can imagine for you guys, sometimes you stay in air conditioned space and you feel quite relaxed and comfortable. Um, however, once the temperature goes below 18 or 17, you start feeling a bit um, cold. So you don't feel that, that comfortable. This is basically what thermal comfort is. And there are two main aspects of thermal comfort is the environment factors, uh, which is the climate parameters that I'm gonna talk about uh, now in a while. And the other factor is the human factors. Now, why I'm saying this, because when we design a space, we need to make sure what's the function that's happening in that space. When you design, for example, a gymnasium, and then, you need to make sure that you have, for example, more cooling energy than if you are designing an office. Uh, that's why we have here something called the metabolic rate. And this is actually reflects your activities uh, rates, uh, how your body is responding. Basically, your body is, is producing uh, heat energy most, I mean, all of the time. And when you do more exercise, then your body will produce more heat and then you need more cooling to feel comfortable. So always make sure that you are, you know why or what's the function of the space that you are designing. In. And when we're talking about thermal comfort, um, the thing is about, about this, actually, we try to achieve the comfort zone. Now, comfort zone for most of people is, is various from one to another. Some people feel comfortable in lower temperature, but in general, when we talk about this, we say the temperature between uh, 20 to uh, 25, for example. Uh, sometimes in tropical countries, um, it, the comfort zone might go a bit higher than this. Um, the same as uh, you are talking about cold countries, for example, uh, in the UK. And people feel comfortable with, for example, 15 degrees Celsius or, or lower than this. So, yeah, it's, it's changed. But the comfort zone that we need to know about it. All right. Uh, that was a bit of an uh, introduction. Now, I'm talking now about the climate parameters. So we understand sustainability. Now we go to the next step, which is tropical. How did we come out with this, um, with this name or with this category? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this uh, climate uh, classification map, but it's called Koppen-Geiger Climate Classification Map. And this, scient uh, this scientist, um, Basically, they created this map to reflect the types and the classifications of uh, the climate. Uh, for instance, um, 
we choose uh, the color for example we choose malaysia and we see the color of the map is around blue uh, navy blue and when we check with the legend here we can see that the navy blue is basically zoom in is basically af so each letter reflects something in this uh, classification for example a reflect tropical and F, which is the second letter, reflects rainforest. So we know that the classification is tropical rainforest. So from here, we got the name tropical, we got the classification tropical. Now, we take, for example, another, another example, for example, the color red. Um, we can see most of the Middle East here in, in uh, color red. So the red color is basically BWH. Now, when we take, when we see here, B is arid, and W is basically a desert, and H is basically hot. So we know it's dry, a hot climate. Um, this is just for your um, knowledge and information that you know basically where we came out with this uh, classification. Now, the first thing I want to talk about in climate parameters is basically the solar radiation and the solar radiation is basically the energy that we are getting the the, the hot energy we're getting from the sun uh, basically when we stand under the direct sunlight or sunbeam we feel hot and that's actually the solar radiation now in this diagram here which is um, quite important uh, it's called the sun chart or the sun path uh, this one is used to know exactly how to locate or how to design your uh, plan or your building. Now, this chart is basically for a tropical uh, climate. And as you can see here, the building in the middle and uh, the one that these horizontal lines reflect the month and then the vertical uh, lines here reflects the hours. So basically with the date and the time, you know exactly how the sun, uh, the angle of the sun will be situated in that location or in that climate. Therefore, you are able to design accordingly. Um, all right. So when we receive the solar radiation, okay, some of the solar radiation will be reflected. Uh, by some materials and some of it will be diffused and also some of it will be absorbed by the material itself. So the idea or the main uh, strategy is to know how to deal with this solar radiation and we are gonna see uh, in a while now. All right, so when, when we talk about solar radiation now, again, guys, I'm, I'm just picking the most important or, or what I believe it's important uh, for you to know or for us to know as uh, designers or as uh, future architects. Um, the topic is very large, but these are the main principles. And once you understand the principle, then you can design in any climate or any country. Um, the things that related to solar radiation is something called albedo uh, coefficient. Now, the albedo coefficient is basically the fraction that tells us if the material absorb more heat or more uh, radiation or reflect more radiation. So when this uh, fraction is basically high, that means the material uh, reflects radiation and therefore we need to use this material, for example, in a tropical climate. If we take here, if we look at the schedule here, um, we see forests or plants is basically 0 0.26, which is uh, basically quite high among these numbers. That means this is a good material to be used to lower the solar radiation absorption in our area. And when we see the warm asphalt, for example, the asphalt, the, the road uh, street materials, is 0 0.1 is very low that means it's actually absorbed a lot of solar radiation and that will be reflected in, in other 
in, in some ways, for example, the temperature, and as we will see in a while. These are this, uh, some diagrams. Um, you see, like, talking about some different materials we see in urban uh, areas sometimes. Um, and that will lead us to something called urban heat island uh, effect. So this is basically not in a, this uh, principle is not for small scale projects, actually for big scale projects. When we are talking about urban planning or urban design, we always need to make sure that we use um, materials with high albedo uh, coefficient. So basically it absorbs less uh, of the radiation. For example, if we see here from the diagram, uh, the, the urban heat island is basically, what, what does it mean? It means that the temperature, uh, the rise or the increment of the temperature in the urban areas more than the suburb or uh, rural area. So for example, you see the diagram here and you see the temperature on the left side and here is the type of the area. You see, for example, downtown here, the temperature is very high. I mean, we are talking about average temperature. It's higher than if we go to suburb, for example, or to the park. And the reason for that is the albedo coefficient. That's, I mean, there are many reasons, but the main reason that the material used, there are a lot of con concretes, a lot of asphalt um, that reflects this uh, increment of temperature. All right. So after that, we came to the wind. And the wind is a very important factor that um, I believe all of, of you guys have encountered um, project with natural ventilation. Um, so that's why the wind is quite important, uh, especially in tropical climate. And when we want to, for example, uh, check or, uh, the, 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 the parameters of the wind or the, um, the measurement of the wind, uh, we measure two main things, basically the direction and we check velocity. And um, this one on, on the left side here, it's called wind rows. Wind rows is basically a diagram that shows us the wind direction and the wind speed. Nowadays, we don't need wind rows. When we go to the site and do site analysis, you just need to use the um, electrical uh, device that will tell you where is the direction of the wind. However, this data is actually allows you to um, do analysis for areas that you are not able to access it. Like if you design for another country or another uh, climates that you don't know, you can search about the windrows for that specific area or location. And of course, wind is quite important uh, when we're talking about some features like the uh, uh, sea breeze and land breeze. And this is for coastal, um, locations. Uh, for example, during the day, um, the water will heat up less uh, or um, um, the, I mean the, the city or the building will heat up faster than the sea. Therefore, the hot or the cold air will go from the sea to the, towards the um, city and then rise up because the hot air usually rise up. At the night is basically different. So knowing this will allow you to design um, accordingly, according to these parameters. Uh, this one also some uh, studies, but um, I, will, I will skip this one, it's quite complicated. Um, all right, so we go for the passive strategies. And again, there are like a lot of strategies you can achieve. However, in this session is the strategies I believe is um, quite affordable, I mean, to do. Uh, we're not talking about big devices and very expensive strategies and all these. This is very easy and, um, and the strategies is affordable actually to do. Now, 
when we design something, when we design, for example, an office building or any type of building, there are two types of designs, usually the conventional building design and the bioclimatic building design. Now, the difference is that the conventional building designs, uh, when we design it, or when designers do this building, they don't really relate um, the, the environmental factors together. So they treat the air, for example, <coughs> sorry, they, they treat the air uh, by itself, and they treat the sun <coughs> by itself, for example. However, when we design in a sustainable way or bioclimatic way, we try to relate all these factors together. As you can see on the sketch uh, on the right side, basically, for example, the, the uh, precipitation, the rain, can be used in, in, in inside the building and then can be reused again, for example. Uh, this one to, uh, you know, um, lower the, or, or to avoid any waste of, of water, for example. Uh, the plants can be used not only for landscape, but then to protect from uh, the sun solar radiation, also to direct the wind into the building, for example. So try always to relate these factors together to have a good result for uh, in any design of building you are talking about. All right, the things that I want you guys to know, um, there are something called bioclimatic chart. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but <clears throat> this chart is quite important when we design in a sustainable or a passive, uh, with a passive strategies. Now, the idea of this chart is that it tells you how the situation is far from comfort from the comfort zone at your location or at your uh, site. And then it proposed to you what are the strategies that will allow you to be in the comfort zone. So for example, as you can see here on the left side is the temperature, and then at the bottom line is basically the humidity. So if we take uh, Kuala Lumpur, for example, um, we go to the temperature of, I believe it's more than 35 sometimes, but let's take 35, and the humidity of um, 75, for example, 75%. And then we put a dot here. Now this dot reflects that, um, uh, I mean, that specific time with a specific uh, date, the, how far we are from the comfort zone. And then if we look here at the site, it suggests that we need around one meter per second, uh, one meter per second air velocity, which is the uh, speed of the air, in order to be in the comfort zone. So you just need to know the temperature, know the humidity, and then you see where you are, and then you check what are the principles that will allow you to be in the comfort zone. So if you are there and then you have air movement of one meter per second, you will be directly in the comfort zone. For example, if we lower the temperature to, for example, here, to 10, and then you see these lines that says we need around 700 what per meter square of radiation, of solar radiation, because we need to get warmer. We need to be, you know, gain more heat. So we will be in the comfort zone. So this quite important uh, chart to know. All right, this is the uh, modern version of the chart. And I will show you the software at the end, how to get this uh, chart. But it's the same idea. All right, another thing is uh, the site planning. Now, if we take the diagrams on the left, um, we can see this is a quite appropriate way to plan um, your massing. Um, the, in, in order to achieve a good ventilation, so this way is quite good for tropical climates. Now, in the middle here, it's not like this, it's, the massing is 
going surrounding all the, um, for example, a courtyard. And this uh, strategy is not actually suitable for tropical climate because this strategy will prevent the spaces from having natural ventilation. This settlement is actually good for dry climates or it's either hot or cold because it saves the temperature inside. So uh, it has all these studies from the day temperature toward, towards the night temperature. So this is in general about site planning. And of course, when we are talking about the sun direction, uh, as I mentioned in the solar radiation before, uh, it's always the short, the short edges or the short sides of the building from the east and the west. Never do long edges or long sides towards east and west. I'm talking about Malaysia specifically. All right. So speaking about solar, uh, of course, well, we need some solar protection. Uh, you can use some kind of louvers or you can use the plants itself to protect from the sun. Another thing you can use is actually a double facade uh, strategy. This double facade will actually uh, protect you from the direct solar um, radiation and will also, for example, if you see in the diagram, there are some ventilation inlet here inside. So if this ventilation, even though if the solar radiation penetrates through the first layer, the ventilation itself will actually cool down the temperature inside for the second layer. Therefore, your inner space will be, um, will be cool or <clears throat> you will have the normal room temperature. So this is a good strategy to be used uh, as well. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. <clears throat> So um, now moving towards uh, ventilation. The first element in ventilation is the attic ventilation. And this is quite important in Malaysia uh, to know how to design the roof. Because always the hot air will go towards up, will rise up. So you have always to have an outlet for this hot air. You cannot just trap the hot air inside the space. So on the right here, there are many strategies that you can follow or, yeah, you can follow in your um, design and in, in designing a roof, for example. And this one is not only for houses. Again, once you understand the uh, principle of, of this attic ventilation, you can propose this or you can design this in any kind of projects. It's not only houses or uh, small projects, but also big projects. All right, so I have a question here. Um, you see these uh, two diagrams here. We are talking about insulation. So on the left side here, there is this insulation under the joist of the roof. However, for this one, is basically the insulation here, just above this concrete. Can anybody tell me what is the difference between these two pictures? Anyone knows? You can just unmute your mic and just speak directly. Anyone? Come on, guys. Um, okay, I, I'm going to say something then. Yes, please. Um, well, I, I think the difference is that because when you trap the air, the, the trap the hot hot air or the space is serving as a air space to isolate, or uh, you know, be, before it transfer into the ceiling and the space below, so there is an air space to consider as a like an air gap to serving as a buffer zone and uh, the ventilation grade, it will allow the heat to, to escape. Yes. So that's what I see here. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Gary, yeah. All right, thank you, Gary. Yes, uh, basically your, your answer is, uh, is correct. 
um, on the right side, on the left side, sorry, on the left side, this um, typical uh, details is basically what we can do in a tropical climate. Uh, this one will allow the, the ventilation, the opening at the side here, will allow the wind to come across and then cool down this uh, space. So you don't have any heat going through the ceiling. However, on the right diagram, this one is actually not suitable for tropical climate. This one is suitable for uh, cold or uh, dry, hot climate. So what's gonna happen there is usually this, um, uh, this insulation will protect this uh, space from um, having any uh, temperature uh, or having any heat or cool energy going through this concrete. So basically, uh, usually have this in, in cold uh, countries. So uh, the, the heat will be trapped inside. So you don't have any ventilation from the sides. You don't have any uh, inlet or outlet. So you will trap the heat for a better thermal comfort. All right. Um, this diagram, you can uh, come to it uh, later. Uh, this one is talking about the efficiency of the, wood, uh, the window shapes. Um, basically, the, 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 it's either horizontal or square or vertical. Uh, and then talking about the, the uh, percentage of the velocity or the air change in the space uh, together with, with the direction. So whenever you choose a window, you have to know that there are always um, principles of choosing a window. Uh, why you choose this and not this. It's not only you just put a window there. And of course, these are the most basic uh, principles of natural ventilation. Um, when you have all these uh, turbulent uh, flow, for example, or you have the venturi effect uh, within two uh, massing, for example. And then this one will be created from the pressure uh, difference. Uh, so whenever you have a building or massing like this, you have to understand that at this point, for example, there is no any wind if the wind direction from the side. However, if you stand at the corner of the building, you will receive a very, very big uh, or large uh, high pressure of, of uh, wind. And you can try it in, in any big uh, massing or building uh, when there is a ventilation. Another thing, of course, uh, the effect of uh, the landscape uh, here on the left, on the left side. Um, you, when you are placing the landscape around your building, you have to know that the landscape itself can direct the wind into the building or just move it away. Uh, for example, in, in Malaysia, we, of course, we need the below one, this uh, type of, of, of uh, landscape. And of course, when we are talking about cross ventilation, um, there are always some elements that you can design in your opening so that will enhance the cross ventilation uh, for example this um, overhang uh, or what we call it the wing wing wall so the wing wall will actually enhance the uh, will, will just direct the wind inside uh, the building for example if we see in this diagram here um, if you don't have the wing wing wall then you might have less efficiency of of uh, natural ventilation. So whenever you design again, if you really want to achieve uh, these passive strategies, you make sure you achieve it in a correct way. So one of the ways is to have this kind of uh, wing walls. And again, this is some principles uh, for um, cross ventilation. Uh, as we can see here, the cross ventilation is always um, studied or designed in the plan. However, the stack ventilation, which the air going from bottom to the up, uh, it's always shown in a section. So these are just some typical um, sections or typical shapes that 
will allow you to have a very good um, natural ventilation, let's say in a tropical climate. All right. So um, moving towards uh, daylighting. Now, the daylighting is quite crucial because we have to understand with the daylighting, there are um, heat energy. So whenever we want to achieve daylighting, we can't really have this heat energy coming uh, with the daylighting. So we always need to understand how to achieve the daylight, but then not to have the heat, the heat energy coming into the space. So one way to achieve that, uh, to use reflectors or um, these kind of overhang uh, reflectors. So the light will basically be reflected on this surface and this surface can be, um, it not need to be like a metal uh, reflective surface. It can be any uh, surface with a plaster finish, for example, uh, painted in a white uh, color that will reflect the light. So once the light, daylight or the sunlight hit this one, the light itself will just be reflected inside the space. However, having this will actually not allow any direct sunlight to pen penetrate towards this uh, space itself. So you achieve daylighting and you just keep the heat uh, outside. Again, this is uh, some also strategies for um, how to achieve the daylighting. Um, and I would like to mention this strategy, which is called uh, an idolic system. And this system is actually, I found it in, in the UK and in many buildings or many spaces, they do this uh, strategy. Um, now, this one will allow you to actually have the daylight very deep inside the space, up to five or six meters. And the way to achieve that, uh, it's having this kind of light uh, duct system. So you basically, above your ceiling, you have this ducting, which uh, made of reflective uh, surface. Uh, usually it's a, it's a kind of metal uh, surface. And once the light will penetrate here, will keep reflecting and then goes directly into the uh, space. So basically, even if you have a very deep uh, plan uh, or section, you still can achieve daylighting in some basic strategies. All right, uh, this one talking about shading device, as again, um, I can share this uh, later, so you can refer to, uh, there are many types and many uh, strategies can be uh, achieved. All right, so, these are basically the most important uh, passive strategies that we can achieve in Malaysia. Um, but again, it, it's not as easy as it, it seems because you really need to make sure it works. You can actually have like a lot of windows, but then somehow you don't really have the natural ventilation that you needed. Or you might have very large windows that will actually allow the heat or the sun direct sunlight to penetrate to your space and then you don't feel comfortable so we really need to make sure it, it works uh, well and these are the summary guidelines uh, based on the site plan building plan structure and openings you can refer to this one as well all right so i hope this uh the, the previous one uh, was clear now some some uh, basic uh, active strategies that I want to talk about. Uh, of course, the first thing is uh, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, panels. Now, these solar panels will actually turn the uh, sunlight into electricity. That's the basic understanding. And it's not really um, a new thing. It's very old uh, strategies that have been used uh, for years. And the main, the, main, uh, the main way that this uh, photovoltaic uh, panels works that will collect the um, 
uh, lighting the solar uh, light and then we'll, through the inver uh, inverter will turn it into electricity and then you will have usually a, a temporary storage uh, battery so it will allow you to use this electricity at night for example until it recharge again uh, during the day and uh, there are many ways you can uh, design with this one it's either you design uh, your, your building only with this uh, solar panels or it can be integrated with the grid system as well uh, so you have um, some electricity from the grid and some electricity from the photovoltaic uh, uh, panels and this this uh, building is actually yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a good example that they use the roof itself the roof tiles as uh, solar panels so basically in this way you, if you have a courtyard for example or you have a like a informal space um, you can have this as a solar uh, as a roof tiles so you have natural lighting at the same time, you are actually generating energy from the sun itself. Another way um, of, of strategies that is the solar collector uh, pellets. Now, this is, again is quite, uh, it's used for many years now. And the, the, the thing that this um, strategy, they use actually to heat up the water. So you have the inlet, um, for the water and outlet and through here you have the solar collector uh, plate so basically it will collect the heat or um, the, the solar uh, the sunlight and then will heat up the water now this is not really an active uh, strategy um, it's it's more into a passive one because it doesn't really use i mean some uh, when, when you search for this one uh, you basically you know, notice some says it's active or some says it's passive but it doesn't matter at the end our goal is to achieve sustainability environmental sustainability to uh, consume less energy um, to not waste any water for example or any energy uh, electricity so we try to achieve that with affordable strategies and this is one of the affordable strategies this diagrams also um, like explain how uh, does it work. Uh, all right. The last thing I want to talk about in active strategies is using the air conditioning, the HVAC system. Now, I believe in Malaysia there are some cases that we can't really use natural ventilation totally. For example, if you have an office building and you have uh, offices, uh, small spaces for office, or you have meeting rooms, this usually you don't really see a naturally ventilated um, uh, meeting room, especially if it's like a formal meeting, uh, meeting room for VIP, for example. Now, there are these situations that you want to have the air conditioning, but you have to know or you have to understand that using the air conditioning is very harmful to the environment during this um, stages of using the, um, the the hvac systems in every stage there is impact to the environment there are gases there are uh, heat for example released to the environment so it's very impactful however if we want to use make sure you use it or you design your space in a way that makes the HVAC system um, efficient enough. And these are the points. If you follow this one, we'll actually have a very efficient HVAC system that will allow you not to waste electricity or use less electricity than any conventional space. For example, you use insulation for your space that will allow you to keep the space cool down. Um, you make sure you use uh, shaded glassing, uh, glazing uh, for your windows, for example. Uh, make sure you don't have a very large air gap uh, in the, I mean, in your space. Um, you don't really need to have a very high ceiling in an air-conditioned space. Uh, this is considered not efficient. So yeah, these are the points 
that will allow us to use HVAC systems in an efficient way. And of course, this one, one of the uh, strategies, but these are more into urban planning, uh, which is the wind energy. Uh, so it's more into a large scale uh, strategies. So yeah, there, there are a lot of strategies. Um, of course, there are also strategies in terms of uh, water, uh, rain precipitation and all these. Um, it's a very big topic. Um, you can always refer to references online. Uh, there are many, many references in terms of this. And these are some of the um, buildings or the net zero energy buildings. All right, uh, these are the principles that generally used in net zero uh, building. Now, um, there are many stages of, of uh, having a building or making a building. There are the design stage and then the side, the source, uh, the building, um, the construction. So there are many stages. So in each stage, there are um, emission of this uh, energy. So we always make sure that we save this kind of energy in, in as much as possible uh, in terms of electricity, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, materials, the usage of materials. Um, so these are the main principles um, to be used in net zero energy. For example, maybe in your next projects in uh, school, you can actually follow this kind of uh, principles, which is net zero energy community center, for example. And yeah, um, the main idea, when you have a building system, uh, when you have whatever system or whatever strategies in your building, and then the other side, you have the energy coming from the grid system, which is the, uh, the electricity at the city, for example. So, when you have net zero energy, when you actually generate energy in your building as much as you usually consume from the grid. So you basically have zero energy from the grid itself. And then you generate all the electricity you needed or all the energy needed inside your building itself. Now, this is called zero, net zero energy, but there are some buildings which are called positive energy which actually not only generate energy for the building itself but then it actually support or produce energy and feed the grid system for example when i was in the uk i went to this building uh, in wales it's called saucer house now this saucer house is basically an energy positive uh, building that they make this actually as a module. Um, uh, it's supposed to be like a residential um, uh, module. So they were testing this building. <clears throat> and then they, the strategies they used there, it turns out during this um, uh, testing uh, period or when they monitor the energy with all these sensors and uh, uh, devices, they see that this building is actually giving energy back to the grid it's not all it's like the energy producing is it's enough and more than enough that giving back to the grid and then the government is actually paying them because they are supporting the grid with the energy so yes and this is in the uk and the place where is there is no sun and the place where you need a lot of heat to heat up the space they can achieve this so basically in Malaysia, we can achieve that easily. I don't think that's difficult, isn't it? All right. Another thing is, another building, this one, is in um, Hawaii. It's a Hawaii get, Gateway Energy Center. Uh, this one also one of the net zero energy. You can look at this uh, project uh, for further exploration. Uh, it uses... Uh, uses like uh, the solar panels mainly. Um, also, they study the inlet and outlet of, of ventilation. So they have a very good natural ventilation system, uh, very good natural lighting. Uh, so they don't really use any energy from the grid. And 
this one yes is a is a tropical uh, it's a tropical building this one is the uh, reunion island this island is in the indian ocean uh, near to madagascar and um, they have a tropical climate as well and this is actually institutional building you can also refer back to this building uh, uh, they use uh, they use net zero uh, energy uh, strategies with all these uh, ventilation system with the double facade for example uh, they have the louvers uh, that protect from the sun they have uh, they studied how to have a really good uh, ventilation system as well you can also refer to this one to uh, study more and of course you are i think you are familiar with this building is uh, the uh, energy um, office in, in in malaysia the energy center malaysian uh, energy center um, this one also considered uh, the net zero energy building so you can also check how they do the natural lighting uh, inside the building the systems they use the efficient system they use the active efficient systems all right so in the last section uh, there are a lot of softwares that you can use as a tool to test your model uh, your building your design um, to help you to achieve uh, sustainable design now these uh, the softwares i'm gonna mention now is like the basics one or the easy somehow that you can always uh, use the first one that i encourage you to use is climate consultant now this climate consultant from the name it's more into the climate parameters uh, if you are not able to um, go to the site um, you can basically just kick in the um, uh, the data for the location it will generate to you all the climate uh, data that very specific in terms of temperature humidity um, wind roses uh, all the data uh, related to climate also it will actually show you this by um, by climatic chart and you can see these red dots here is basically reflecting the hours um, uh, during the day uh, during the year the whole year so this green uh, small box here is basically um, the comfort zone so you can see that there are a lot of hours that is not in the comfort zone and then what's good about this is actually suggest to you what strategies you need to achieve the comfort zone for example you need uh, sun shading you need natural ventilation um with the percentage with all these um, details you can always uh, refer to i personally always use this one um, for this uh, strategies for the passive strategies and i also use this one it's called design builder now this software will allows you to do um, ventilation simulation so basically whenever you have a model you just uh, Put it inside the software and then we'll just um, do the simulation for um, the, the the wind around the building or inside the spaces if you have opening it's very good very useful for testing your natural ventilation strategies and it also has a lot of um, um, uh, other benefit of testing the uh, radiation uh, or the simulation simulation for radiation um, and other uh, useful tools as well this one is um, the easiest or i believe uh, some of you know are familiar with this ecotech is under uh, autodesk and it's free to download it's um also works the same uh, you can always test the uh, solar or the sun path and the shading mask um, for your building uh, inside the space or outside the building itself. Um, it also can test the uh, simulation for ventilation, for um, 
as I mentioned also, uh, solar radiation. Now, the last one is basically the most complicated or one of the most complicated uh, softwares, um, which is Dynamo. And with this software, you actually use a lot of plugins to simulate your building or your uh, environmental uh, simulations. Uh, one of the plugins called uh, Ladybug. This Ladybug will allow you to have the same simulation, but it's more into details and more uh, complicated. So for your normal projects, you don't really need to have this. Uh, but if you are doing thesis, for example, I really encourage you to have this kind of uh, softwares. So I hope you, uh, that's exactly 50 minutes. I hope you um, got to learn one or two things from this uh, sharing session. Uh, I understand it's typical, um, most of it typical information, but again, uh, it's always encouraged to have this kind of sustainable designs uh, in, in, in a country that it's easy to achieve that, like Malaysia, for example. So um, thank you so much again. Uh, I really appreciate you guys are uh, attending this, even though it's um, weekend. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, attendance. And uh, if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mahmoud. So as a student myself, I personally gained a lot of new information. Like the diagrams are so clear. Like I didn't know we can reflect sunlight like a periscope into the interior. Yeah. And then knowing uh, new keywords like albero coefficient. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in summary for you all, you a good design doesn't depend on the looks and aesthetics. We need to consider yeah. other factors like thermal uh, comfort, sunlight, ventilation, yeah. and yeah. so on to uh, get a good design for an architecture and also be a good architect. Exactly, okay. exactly. This, this is very important. Uh, for me, I, I usually start my, whenever I have presentation, I start with these uh, aspects, uh, you know, because I, for me, it's very important to have this one in the first place. And then we are talking about aesthetic uh, values, for example. But yes, uh, good architecture that will make people feel comfortable, uh, it's either physically or mentally. Yeah. All right. So the audience has been hitting in some interesting questions. Okay, this one is from Gary. He asks, is this climate classification will be affected by climate change and therefore impact the design accordingly? Okay, um, it will not really affect the climate classification uh, itself. For example, if the classification is tropical, it will be always tropical. However, it will affect specifically in the details of this climate. For example, if you look at the climate data, data for the past 50 years in Malaysia, I am sure you will notice the average temperature was lower than the average temperature that we are having now. That's the reason of, uh, that's because of the uh, climate change. But then we are still having a tropical climate, you know, and the past 50 years, we are still having tropical climate. So the classification itself will not change, but the details of this will change. I hope that clear. I hope that answer your question, Gary. Okay, so next uh, question will be asking if a building can achieve stack ventilation by opening some hole or get on the ceiling? This question is referring to your slide 21. Okay, let me go to 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, what's the question again? The question is, uh, if a building can achieve stack ventilation, if he opens some hole or gap on the ceiling. 
Uh, yes, uh, basically the stack ventilation. Um, it's the, the because why why we have stack ventilation strategy because the hot air will always rise up. So you always need an outlet um, for the hot air to to go from from up, you know, from the the roof or from the sea. This also, you know, should be designed. Um, in a good way uh, when you design your roof. Now, when you have a ceiling, um, this might, of course, affect the stack ventilation because um, you don't really have any opening uh, or you don't have access to the roof system. However, um, you still can achieve stack ventilation by having um, opening at the top of the wall, just lower than the ceiling, for example. If you look here, um, you can have an opening in this area, and uh, this will actually allow for the hot air to just go. You know, if you just have closed ceiling, you can have opening on top of the wall that the hot air will just go out. Answers your question. Okay, so next is also from Gary. Uh, he asked, does net zero energy building uh, not including embodied energy? Yes, um, it's actually um, including that as well. So um, when, when you design or when you want to achieve um, the, uh, the build, as, as I mentioned, there are many stages when you are doing a building. So the embodied energy basically this one or this uh, uh, factor, you will um, control it when you are choosing the material itself. So if you are choosing concrete, which has a high embodied energy, for example, compared to um, a timber, and yes, that's actually included in the, in the net zero energy uh, building. But uh, this one is only in the stage of choosing material. Now, in the long term, we are also looking at the uh, electrical consumption uh, or the, uh, if there is any um, electricity coming from the grid, you know, um, so we need to reduce that. So uh, it's like, it's, it's the, the, whole, the whole building or the whole uh, uh, steps of designing this building should be, uh, near to the net zero um, energy strategy. All right. Uh, that's all the questions from the chat box. Uh, do, you have, do you guys have any more questions? We'll leave a few minutes for you guys to have any inquiries. One more additional question for Gary, from Gary. Is concrete, uh, does concrete have a higher embodied energy than steel? Um, actually, I'm not really remembering this, um, but you can always refer to, um, there, there is a schedule that shows the embodied energy for every materials and basically, What's embodied energy is the energy that uh, you need uh, to consume to produce such material. For example, the, the, I, I think, I'm not really sure about this, it can always refer to that, but I think the steel is actually higher than uh, concrete because uh, you need uh, very high energy to produce uh, the steel in specific shapes uh, and to be constructible uh, in a building, for example. However, the concrete, um, you just need less energy for, for that to be built. Uh, yes, you can, you can refer, refer to uh, schedules for that. I, I, think, I think the steel is more, more, yeah. So, uh, so uh, in order with that question, uh, it, it makes steel more sustainable, right? 
Uh, no, uh, the higher embodied energy is actually not not good. You know, um, you, you need materials with the lower embodied energy. Um, for example, uh, let's take the temper. Um, when you are seeing the temper from the beginning that you cut the tree, for example, and then you um, make the the correct shape of the timber, for example, timber column, and then you install that timber column. So the energy used from the beginning to the end of the construction, from the beginning of getting the material and producing the material to the construction, that's called embodied energy. So high embodied energy is not really good um, for the environment because uh, it will, you know, have all this impact when you uh, produce the steel, for example, or produce the concrete. Um, all this energy is very impactful to the environment. So the higher, we always go with the lower embodied energy. That's more sustainable. So I think that sums up our Q&A session. I hope that answers your question, Gary. Okay. So uh, I hope you guys apply to apply today's knowledge in your future project or other maybe semester projects because I think sustainable isn't a word that we just put out there but it makes a big impact on saving the earth also. Okay, so as a future architect, you, you are a main responsibility in saving the earth. Okay, so... So thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well as I do. So do keep in touch with our master's Instagram and Facebook for the next online lecture. So if you have any uh, question about this kind of research, you can also uh, look for Mr. Mahmoud. So yeah. until then, have a nice night and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.